Okay, so uh, today I'm gonna talk on, uh, thanks for the introduction, first of all. So I'm gonna talk about uh, logup. Uh, usually I'm not a friend of names for protocols, but after a while I, I was tired always saying about lookup argument based on logarithmic derivatives. And uh, so it, it somehow just happened to be called logup. Quite recently, actually, the paper, uh, well, the e-print that uh, I, I did, this piece of work actually was initiated by the CK8 in Berlin. So I was sitting there watching Benedict's talk, also William talk. Back then, no idea about multivariate provers uh, and started to think, how could you ever prove the permutation argument without having a time action on the Boolean hypercube? Uh, so, and, uh, yeah, so, and that put me, that, 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 uh, that really set me back to the, uh, to the idea that I had back when I was at Horizon Labs, like one and a half years ago or something, I just played around, yeah, you can turn the grant product argument of Planck into a grant sum argument using logarithmic derivatives. I didn't see any use of it, uh, but now it seems to have found its purpose and its batch lookups, or what I call batch column lookups. So just, just to frame here, what, what, what I consider, because there's so many terms, there, is, there are multi-column lookups, uh, some people call them vector column lookups, and so on. Uh, so what I consider as batch lookup argument is really, uh, batch column lookups. So that's, uh, so you have typically one table, one column table, I mean that's not restricted to one column, but an ordinary size table, so it's, it's of size of, uh, of uh, an ordinary trace length, let's say 2 to the 16, 2 to the 20, it's not, so we are not gonna target the techniques of Gabison and Egan that go beyond, that, that, do, that are able to leverage linearity of KZG in order to provide what I call huge table lookups. So this is the classical framework here. Uh, so no KZG typically below, but it's not restricted to that. So, uh, so we have one column table say, but we have many, many columns of witnesses that are subject to one and the same lookup. And this situation, this arises, but uh, specifically when you deal with CKVMs. Just consider, uh, Typically, what you need to prove at certain, for certain columns of a CKVM, if not many, uh, is that they are all, all entry in each column is, say, a 16-bit word. So, it's a, a, the, so you have many columns subject to one and the same range proofs. Uh, I'm not sure if Hamish is here. Hamish is here. I never can remember, for example, the arithmetic unit of system zero how many, how, how many columns are subject to 16-bit lookup? Something like 70? Yeah. 70 to 100, so just to give you the scope. So it's not, it's not uh, how to say, uh, exotic. That situation that you face many, many columns, 70 to 100 columns, subject to one and the same range check or lookup. Uh, another thing is that, that was pointed to me actually by, uh, by Bobin from, from Maiden. Uh, so if you have a CKVM and you decide for a, a uh, lookup-based arithmetic hash function like tip five or uh, take uh, reinforced concrete or something like it, uh, you typically by chip design end up with a hash chip where you face the same problem because you want to scale, you have a lot of columns subject to the same lookup. Uh, so these are the use cases, the two main use cases that are faced. Maybe there are others, I don't know, but these are the main use cases. Uh, so this talk, just the structure of it, uh, I'm not gonna be very math-like. So it's early in the morning, I had some beers yesterday, uh, actually good white wine. So I'm going to keep that as reduced as possible and as picturesque, uh, pic picturesque, how to say that? Okay. Uh, so, so I will just give a quick intro how, in general, uh, multi-set checks, permutation arguments, and lookups, what's, what's 
a little math behind. What's the idea? And then uh, we go to the state of the art protocol if you don't use KZG and this cache quotient improvement. So the, the state of the art generic lookup protocol is lookup so that, we'll, uh, that I will just simply sketch what's the main idea here. I call it a geometric idea. I'm not sure how Ariel would, uh, would see that. Uh, I confront him the other day. So, and then uh, I'll talk about logup. What? Just a quick overview. Uh, and last but not least, that's, that's very important because uh, I'm not the only one who was thinking almost at the same time on uh, using logarithmic derivatives, something that goes back to, you know, uh, calculus one, you know, uh, uh, its usage uh, in the context of, uh, of permutation arguments, lookup arguments, and likewise, in crypto. Uh, and mo most of all, I, deep, I was not aware of this work at all, Lion. So, uh, yeah, where is he? Hi. Uh, so, uh, it was Gabison Arel who, the first, he was the first one who pointed me at it, you know? Like, when, uh, when Flukov was already out, and also my paper, uh, which I called very complicated, something like multivariate lookups on uh, whatever. I yeah. can't even remember the name. So, it's the one that I referred, and I will post the link at the end. So, and, uh, so, Flookup is very much related. Even the, uh, they don't explicitly call it using logarithmic derivatives, it's implicitly always present. And it's even more present in the subsequent work, uh, uh, Egan together with Gabison. CQ, and I'm looking forward to your talk, to Ariel's talk on CQ Lin. Okay, so multi-set checks, permutation arguments. So how do they work? So typically, you do just one thing. Uh, what do you want to prove? You have two sequences. Here is the witness sequences. That's typically the table sequences. Sequence. Uh, in this case, they're of equal length, say. And you want to prove that uh, these sequences are the same up to permutation. So that means uh, if here one value occurs three times, it occurs, has the same occurrence number here. So it's, that's why it's called multi-set equality or multi-set check. So, and what you have in mind is, yeah, okay, you just construct two virtual polynomials. Uh, I, I, I come back to it, why virtual? So virtual polynomials, you just have them in mind in the design of the group, and they all encode just by zeros uh, the, 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 the elements of the sequence. And uh, of course, uh, these two are permutations of one another if these virtual polynomials on the left side and on the right side are equal as polynomials. And that's what you use. Uh, because you don't want to put that for a prover to compute this polynomial. It would be too expensive. What you do is, you, it's, it's kept virtual. Nevertheless, it's challenged. You challenge, uh, if, uh, you challenge, you sample a random challenge for x, and then you reduce it to just proving uh, products of scholars instead of linear factors. So we reduce it to a grand product identity. And typically, you prove it the Planck way in the end. Uh, but that's not so important. So that's the thing. You have virtual polynomials. So two, two sequences are the permutation of one another if these virtual polynomials are, are, are correct. And overwhelmingly in the randomness you sample, uh, if, the pro if the products, the grant products are the same, then we may conclude over overwhelmingly that the polynomials are the same. So that's, that's, the, that's the way, that's the, that's the idea behind any permutation argument. And uh, this idea at least goes back to Bayer growth, if even not farther. I'm not sure. Ariel, you probably know better. Yeah. Mm. Okay, lookups is a bit more subtle. Why that? So, you, again, we have two sequences, and now they're not necessarily of the same length. So, witness sequence and table sequence, and you want to test what I call set membership. So you remove all the multiplicities, reduce them to multiplicity one, even if a value occurs 10 or 100 times, and, uh, and you want to prove that 
that the, the set of values of the one sequence is contained in the set of values covered by the table sequence. And what does it mean? You have to take into account that, uh, that certain table values that occur in the witness sequence occur more often than just once. The table typically references just once. So you, uh, so, and, and that's the case even only to talking again in this virtual polynomial uh, 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 representation. It means like uh, this, uh, this sequence is as a set contained in the other, even and only if, if you can find multiplicities, integer values, 0, 1, 2, 3, whatever, uh, you have to adapt them accordingly, at most at length, the length of the sequence, of course. This, is, this typically is not too large, but large enough. But in any case, so you find uh, if there exists a sequence such that uh, this polynomial can be produced by the table roots, choosing the right multiplicity, which might be zero. So if, if something doesn't occur at all in uh, one table value doesn't occur at all, you choose the zero here. If it occurs once, you choose one. If it occurs 100 times, you choose 100. So that's, 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 the, that's the issue here, to find, uh, to uh, the problem is you can't e prove it that easily. The I an IOP for this type of identity is problematic. And the first one that I know uh, that tackles it is uh, the one from the ARIA paper. And what they do is, uh, because you know the sequence, let's say it's, it's 2 to the 18, typical trace length, uh, long. So, so you decompose, the you know that the multiplicity can be at most 2 to the 18, let's say they have at most 18 bits. So they encode the multiplicity bitwise, use this bit representation. Of course, it's always challenged. This, virtual, this polynomial is always kept virtual. It's challenged at the random alpha. But the, the main importance is you encode the multiplicity in a binary representation. And then uh, you, you, you commit to these, uh, to these bits, column, uh, I mean, instance-wise. And then you prove. Uh, uh, you prove uh, these powers of two of, uh, you, you put together using the powers of two of the table roots and you prove, you, uh, I mean they can be pre-computed. So, so I, I'm, it's not so important, I didn't well explain it right now. Uh, it, it's not gonna be important for the rest. It's complicated, that's the only thing uh, that I want to give here. So, look up. Uh, I call it an integrability criterion. I don't know how Ariel would see it. So, uh, so that's the way I how see it. So, so you have, uh, this is uh, amazing idea in my opinion. So to prove, uh, so, so consider if you have a sequence, consider the derivative. What do I mean by the derivative of the sequence? It, it, it's, uh, it's something like this. This is the point where at, where I'm looking at the derivative, and this is the increment. The next value is representative for the increment. And if you have one, if, if you want to prove that one sequence is contained in the other, it means that every increment in that sequence must occur also in the table. Wait, it's not that simple. Uh, so consider, maybe the, the constructive ways easier here to explain why this criterion holds, or give you a guess, a hint of it. So you take, you put, you, you, mer you, you just up, uh, put this sequence together, you take the union of these sequences and sort it, okay? Then, of course, uh, you can say that if you look at the derivative of the sequence, that uh, the changes, where I make changes, could be on only come from the table, and then you hit that value of the table a certain number of times. The multiplicity many times, that value occurs exactly uh, with no difference at all because it's sorted. Not well explained, but this is, uh, I hope it gives you a direction here. So uh, in short, we have this, this subset contained in the table uh, sequence set, if and only we find function s, an integral, 
that's put together to the derivative from t and, uh, and here always equal the derivative uh, set to zero from, from the witness sequence. Or it, in polynomials, it looks like this. If it's too much, just uh, think of the lunch in a few minutes and so on. Yeah? So, so this is just, yeah. You encode these derivatives as zeros in the multivariate sense. So this is like uh, decomposing a, multi, a, a bivariate polynomial into its so to called zeros and, and the vector uh, which encodes coefficient-wise exactly the derivative vector. And here, this is the, the corresponding encoding for a table uh, increments, and this is the corresponding term for the witnesses uh, always at the same level. So zero increment here. Yeah, and that's, as usual, is only kept virtual. And then you sample randomnesses for uh, x and y and uh, end up with grunt products to be proven. So how would that look, li look like for batches? Uh, it's generalized, straightforward. So it doesn't, uh, so, uh, well, what I, in a previous slide well, it was considered just one column sequence. But the same holds if you have 100 columns table. You merge them and you sort them. So that you end up with something like this. I made just this line in order to visualize that uh, it's just as large as the union of these two. Yeah? Yeah? I think these slides are shared. I'm not sure. Are these slides shared on the web page, or I'm, I don't know. In any case, uh, I will. So. Yeah, maybe one thing to say about that. That's not the form you find in the Plucker paper. That's the one uh, you find in a, in a blog post of uh, in a HackMD of Ariel. So. It's, it's the more elegant one. Uh, the, 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 the one from the paper is more even directly thinking in the derivative, uh, having here not the next point, but the difference, really the difference. So it's really more pure. At, it's, it's the vector field you get when you, uh, when you take the, the vector field of the derivative. So uh, going back to batches. So you, you take the joint union, you sort it accordingly. What I'm never saying, what's the order? The order is as given in, uh, in, in the table. Uh, and so, so you per se need to, so this depicts just the main cost uh, of the protocol. It's, it's very rough. So if I only look at how many extra columns you have, which has impact on the commitment effort of the prover. I mean, besides what has to be, what is committed anyway, because typically it's part of uh, an IOP for some snark or so, uh, you need to commit the sorted union of this, uh, uh, of this joining here, the sorted union. And then you need to prove exactly the product we were talking about. This one, you know, challenge at alpha, beta. beta. So, uh, and this leads you to, if we just restrict ourselves, that, that I do just for simplicity and to be able to compare to log up, if you restrict yourself to, to, to an IOP of degree two only, that, uh, that amounts to having running product uh, as many columns as these two boxes are large. You take the quotient of the two, that's why you have only one running product, you, so you prove it's equal to one, like in Planck. So, so this is this depicts uh, the commitment effort of plug-up pl applied to batches of columns, and that we keep in mind. I'll return to that. You don't have to keep it in mind like autistic. Uh, <laughs> so, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll return to that pi picture in a second. So log-up. Um, yeah, logarithmic derivatives. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a simple thing from uh, from from calculus, from analysis. You know, uh, you take you take uh, 
if it's analysis, you know, you take the log you can take the logarithm of a function typically if it's not negative valued or so, you know. And what happens if you make the, the, the derivative of it? Oh, it's the chain rule, no? Chain rule, out of derivative, we have the log of some in, in, inner function. Out of derivative is uh, one over the something. And then times the inner derivative. And that's called the logarithmic derivative because it's the derivative of the logarithm of something. And that's exactly also what you use in the discrete world as definition. Logarithmic derivative, the definition of it is the formal derivative, which is as uh, you defined just for polynomials, you know, like uh, I will do some examples, it will, uh, will be become clear from it. So it's the formal derivative of, uh, of the polynomial in question and then over the initial polynomial here. Why do we do it? The main reason is what important property does the logarithm have? It turns products into sums. And the same will hold also for the derivative. We'll see that in a second. So it, uh, I just have to switch one thing more. Yeah, it turns product into sums. Let, uh, let's, let, let, me, let me show that on the on the sketchboard, it's, it's more, it's nicer here. So, so let's consider product here. Uh, uh, well, maybe it's better to use the formal definition here, you know? I mean, from, from, from go, co using calculus one, it's obvious, you know? Just, just to, to, par to, to rephrase what I've said, you know? It's, it's, it's the sum of the logs, first of all, as a function before I do any, any derivative. And now, and now I do the derivative, consequently, by linearity, we have the logarithmic derivative over of P plus the logarithmic derivative of Q. And that holds also formally. There's always a strong relationship. Yeah. Okay. So uh, just quickly uh, going over that uh, over that example. You know, if you have uh, two functions, one is a linear factor with uh, with that root, and the other one with the other, we get here this. You know, just if you use the definition, you make uh, the, the derivative. Uh, we take the product rule here, it's one, ti one times this plus this times one over the original and if you can always cancel out, if you split the sum and cancel out with the common terms, you end up, you see it once again, it's the sum of the two. So zeros are turned, and the important, so what we see here, that's why I choose this example, zeros are turned into poles. And if we have the same zero, it doesn't matter, this is how the whole thing works. So then we have the same here, so the, the same polar Q is twice, additively twice. Or more general, if we have some, uh, C, some root with a certain multiplicity, it occurs exactly with the same multiplicity of the pole. And that's the useful thing used by log up, fluke up, and, and others. Sorry? Yeah, I mean, just as a definition, you have, you have a pole of order one here. Uh, yeah, in that case, so, so, so uh, even if you have, uh, a root has multiplicity 10, it's a simple pole with multiplicity 10. So, and that's, that's, that brings us to the key lemma of, uh, of, of log up. Uh, so we now can, uh, the funny thing is that additive multiplicity is much more easy to handle than multiplicative, uh, uh, so multiplicity of poles are much more easy to handle than that of, uh, of, of roots. And uh, so one is contained in the other. If we find a multiplicity sequence such that we have, uh, we take the multiplicity of the poles and get the sum of the poles of the witness sequence. And that's the one what you challenge 
and end up with a sum check, not grant product, with a sum check. It's rational though. So you have to turn it into polynomial uh, expressions and so on, but it's a sum check. Okay, so how does it look for batches? So many columns, table, we have to provide the multiplicities as many as, we, as the table is large. Many, uh, and uh, and uh, these are the helper function that turns, uh, uh, that turns a rational sum check into polynomial expressions to, to prove in a polynomial IOP the one over terms. Uh, I, I was wasting too much time in the introduction, so I cannot explain this now. But believe me, you need them, unfortunately. But then, for the, for, and that's, that's the key difference to plug up. And that's the power of grant sums over grant products. They just fall together without increasing degree. Even if you have one million columns, it's still a degree one sum check you do. So, uh, so you end up with a single, having a low degree with a single column of running sums. Okay, so just to recap the two, uh, the two generic lookup protocols. Lookup, you know, what extra columns do we have besides the witness and table? Sorted union, there's no way around it. And then the running product uh, for, you know, that lookup identity. Lockup, the helper functions but then only a single column for the running, uh, for the running sums. And that's the big uh, difference. And moreover, you can, in the same way, if you say I don't want to run a degree t the two program, program I, can, uh, I can go to degree five, seven, like Plonky two, uh, then you can do the ordinary off trade between reducing the number of columns that hold also for the phi, here, for the running products here, you batch products together by increasing the degree, so less, less running, uh, running product columns versus increasing the degree. And here's the same, less helper functions. So just recap, that's the conclusion. Sorry for being a bit longer. So, uh, uh, so just roughly to give you an impression, uh, logup has about 50% less extra columns to commit. And that counts for these wide trace programs uh, several CKVM implementation phase. Uh, it's, and moreover, that what I said before, they can be reduced using this off-trade degree versus less columns. It's already implemented by William, uh, so we have it in our Plonky 2 code base. It's not yet re reviewed, uh, but it's online, it's public. So, and if you would like to see some math, some more details, uh, click on that link. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ulrich, for this nice talk. Um, we can maybe take one or two quick questions while the next speaker can already come forward and uh, set up. Um, I will go around because otherwise we don't hear the questions on the recording. And can you answer into that microphone, please? So, any questions? Yes. Uh, might be a stupid question, but between permutation argument and lookup, so permutation argument, you get the cardinality, lookup where you look only at the sets. That there is a middle way, right? Where you, where you look at the, there is a middle way where you look at the sets, but you also want the cardinality to to be less than in the other set. I, I'm not sure it makes sense. <laughs> so, but. <laughs> Is, is there a middle, middle way between the two, two things? Never in thought of it before. And I'm, uh, to be frank, I'm not sure, uh, don't, don't, can't 100% can't follow your question. Okay, yeah. So, so between look at a uh, permutation argument where, mm -hmm. where the cardinality should be the same in mm -hmm. the two sets, and, and where you only look at the set inclusion, yeah. there can be a version, I'm not sure it's useful, where the set inclusion is, is important, but the number of elements should also be less than in the. No, no, I mean, for the lookup, the, the big witness se sequence can be super huge. Yeah. Because uh, if, if you only mention uh, values from that comparable small table, then uh, as a set, it reduces to something small in any case. Yeah, yeah, okay. So that's... Yeah, good. Yeah. Thank you. 
or questions? Yes. Thank you for the awesome talk and research. Uh, in the paper you mentioned, uh, yeah, you can go from a multivariate setting to a univariate setting. Do you have any intuition that you can share, if any, behind how that reduction occurs? I mean, the, pro the, uh, the only reason why I wrote that paper for the multivariate setting was because it originated in my thoughts about multivariate Planck. Okay. Uh, so, but uh, everything that I was talking here, I mean, uh, I was, uh, that actually applies to the univariate case. It just simply generalizes. The same, it, it's the same. same uh, yeah. I did it because I wanted to learn multivariate world. Uh, but in the end, it's the same. You just have different techniques. So some check is more the core in the multivariate thing, but you don't need to have quotient. You there don't, don't exist quotient polynomial on the other hand. Uh, so, so, but essentially, uh, I mean, Planky 2 is an uni, univariate prover. So uh, it's, uh, if you maybe, if your coder look, look there, if it's not obvious to you how to put the, the, the multivariate polynomial IOP into, the only variable. I will dive in this week. <laughs> okay. All right. So I guess we need to move forward. Uh, let's thank Ulrich again.